Oh, well, my server can't handle this. Viens, divi, trīs skaņas tests, tūlīt pārbaudīsim, kā mēs sevi dzirdam. Ieslikcī sāksies pēc aptuveni 10-15 minūtēm.
want, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, hello, we will start the lecture here and uh, I have a pleasure to give a floor to our guest lecturer, Professor Ron Bergen. Berger. So you will introduce yourself. Uh, does it work? No, it's not working. It works? it works now. It yeah. Works? Besides, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Besides uh, being here in this lecture here in the room, uh, we have a lecture also in live stream, live stream. But yeah, now I can give a floor to you. You will introduce yourself okay. and your topic. <laughs> Can you hear me now? And really today when we look at Israel, people say Israel is a startup nation. So many startups, so many knowledge comes from Israel. What made it a startup nation? So these are areas that people came to me as an international professor. I teach in China, I teach in India, I teach in the UK. And they came to me and said, Ron, why is Israel a startup nation. Why are you different than us? And I didn't know how to answer this question. So when I don't know how to answer the question, what I do is I research it. I go and check. And I managed to build a certain structure, what made Israel special. And what I want you to do, think, what can you take from my lecture and implement it in Latvia, okay? Because we come from different culture. 
So maybe culture will not work. But some things will work. And I can tell you that when you study business, your future is linked to innovation. If you will be the same as everybody else, your salary will be very low. If you start thinking using your brain, less your hands, you'll become more successful, get better salary, get a better job. We look for people who think, okay? And if you have a just any question, just raise your hand and say, I have a question. So I decided to call this lecture, The Power to Astonish, Key Drivers of Success. So let's just start and try to understand the evolution of a country, okay? So many countries start as you can see here, agricultural economies. What is an agri agricultural economy? It's an economy that grows their food, and what they grow, they eat. Sometimes they export it. Many countries like Africa, in Africa, are really agricultural economies. Is Latvia also a bit agricultural economy? I think a bit. 4% only. So it's. I think it's not agricultural, yes, but agricultural economies are generally weak economies, okay? They grow what they need. As they progress, they move sometimes to resource-based economies. That is like Russia. Any Russian students here? No? Okay. If you look at Russia, think how large this economy is. Do you have anything on your tables in your home that says manufactured in Russia? Not really. What is, what is keeping the Russian economy afloat? Raw materials. Yeah, if Putin needs some more money, he takes a spoon, digs in the ground, and suddenly he finds an oil well. If not, gas. If not, wood. If not, metal. They're so rich in natural resources, okay? For instance, my country, Israel, if you dig, you find sand. There's nothing. Yes? When I read the Old Testament, I say, oh, Moses should have taken us to Saudi Arabia. Yes? Why to the land of, of milk and honey? There's nothing there. Yes? But that's maybe what made us what we are because we live in a nothing. Yes? In a desert that has nothing. If you look also at a lot of Arab countries, they're not that innovative. Why? Because life is easy, right? In Saudi Arabia, if you need money, you dig an oil well in your backyard and you have an oil well. So why work very hard? Okay, of course I'm exaggerating, but these are resource-based economies. And then moving on, there are some countries that are built on industrial economy, like China 10 years ago. Mass production, producing quantity cheaply. That's called process innovation using your hands. But whoever knows, today, finding labor in China is very difficult. Because of the one-child policy, nobody wants to work in a factory. So the Chinese have understood, like in Israel, we must move to the knowledge economy, moving from working with your hands to working with your brain. Okay? In my country, to find somebody that is willing to pick oranges, very difficult. Yes, sometimes I need help to clean my house. Finding somebody that will come to clean my house, impossible because nobody wants to work. We all want to sit in an office with a computer, yes, air conditioner, and use our brains. Nobody wants to use their hands. So today even we import workers because nobody wants to work. Okay, so this is knowledge economy. It's an economy that is based on brain power and not manpower. Okay? So again, I think, I don't know enough about Latvia. Is Latvia more manpower-based or more brain-based? Okay? Think about that. Because the higher you move up the hierarchy, the more advanced, the more value-added country you will be. Okay? Even China understands that, that they have to stop mass production and they have to move from manufactured in China to invented in China, okay? And we in Israel have no choice but to be knowledge economy because we don't have many people, we don't have much land, we live in nothing, 
The only thing we have is brain power. But how did we get there? And that is something that is very, very important. But before we go into that, what do we need to have a knowledge economy? What are the basic fundamental points that you need? An educated and skilled labor force, okay? So we need people who are well educated, good universities, good practical universities, because one of the problems in most of the universities in the world, a lot what they teach you is irrelevant for finding a job. It's a lot of theory that has little to do with the real life. Secondly, there's also a lot of universities that the quality is not that high. So when you go out to look for a job, what then? And again, I'm a China expert. I see that a lot in China, a lot in India as well. I teach in Jindal, which is a private university, but I look at uh, many universities also in the, the Delhi region. The quality is not there, so you buy a degree. So really, you need to push, and that comes the government, for education. That's how I got my PhD. Yeah? Uh, my mother came to me and said, Ron, you know your grandfather had a PhD, your father has a PhD, when are you doing your PhD? There's this push, push, push for education, and because there is so much competition to get into university, you have to be very good at what you do. Okay, so you need educated and skilled. Educated is here, skill is I need to know how to do things. Meaning when you finish your degree in finance, can you start working in a bank? Or do you know only the theory? Okay, you need to know, be work ready. And that is sometimes the problem with universities. We need a modern information infrastructure. If it is roads, if it's uh, communication, if it is nice offices, all the infrastructure, incubators, to create this knowledge. We need good legal system, and we need a mindset that we want to be entrepreneurs, <laughs> okay? This is a big problem, because for instance, when I teach in China innovation, and I teach in one of the top schools, I have about 100 MBA students sitting in front of me, and then I ask them, how many of you want to work in the Central Bank of China? And how many of you want to open your own business? 95% want to work in the Central Bank of China. Why? I go to work at 9, come home at 4, good salary. I'm not looking for any problems. Okay? So again, being an innovator is high risk, high pressure. 95%, if not more, fail. Can you accept failure? Chinese cannot. They say it's a loss of mianzi, face. Yes, I have failed many times in my life. But every time I fail, I learn from it. I become stronger, I become better. Okay, this is something very important to understand. If we look at what's happening in the world, you will see that growth is going down. Even today, with the virus, they claim that the world growth will be somewhere between, somewhere around 2.4%. That's very, very low. Yes? The growth of my country, that has nothing, is about 3.5-4%. Why? Because we have innovation. Yes? We have war around us. We have no government for about a year. Today, yesterday was our election. And really, our ranking hasn't gone down because nobody cares if we have a government, no government, because as long as we have innovation, and innovation um, is really um, not linked to anything else, it's strong economy, okay? So the economy is built on small, medium enterprises, on small things, okay? And now they have understood in Europe, in Asia, that in order to push forward, you need to teach innovation. So you need a smart government, you need smart universities, you need smart students, and to teach the students why study innovation. 
Yes? Why to do that? Okay? And many countries um, have not had that. If somebody doesn't know where Israel is, it's this thing here, which means when I fly with Baltic Air to Israel, the pilot must be very aware because if he closes his eyes, it crosses Israel. It's so small. From here to here, it's about one hour drive. From here to here, it's about five hours with a car. This is Israel. Now, generally, they want us dead. They want us dead. They want us dead, dead, dead. We have some kind of peace, but if I go there, it's a one way. <laughs> so really, the only um, area that they like us is the sea. <laughs> yes, and all these want us to go there. Okay, to the sea. So virtually, we're an island. Meaning if we don't have enough electricity, we cannot ask our neighbors, can you give us electricity? If we don't have enough water, we cannot ask our neighbors, can you lend us some water? If I want to go on vacation, I need to fly. <laughs> yes? So generally, in Easter, which is our Passover, it's your Easter, out of roughly Israel is about 8 million people, about 6 million people leave Israel. That you understand. Because if I want to go on holiday, where can I go? Yes? So in, in children's holiday, the, the country is almost empty. Yes? There's no cars, nothing. Only those people or do not have a budget or have a lot of work, they stay in Israel. Yes? So this is why Baltic Air is flying, I think, five times a week from Israel to, to Latvia and from Latvia we go all over the place. Yes, we fly a lot. Okay? So Israel is, is, is an island. So what made Israel what it is? Mm. Question. So I came and divided it into three. Culture, infrastructure, and what God gave us. Okay? That's roughly what it is. So let's start going over them. And all the time, think in your brains, hmm, what is close to me? What is close to Latvia? What can I learn from it? Because not everything fits Latvia. Okay? So culture. You see, we are a culture of a big mess. Yes? In, in my country, we hate hierarchy. We hate paperwork. We hate laws. Okay? Um, we do not respect bosses. Even in the army, I have never saluted an officer. I salute knowledge. Okay? It's very, very different. We call our prime minister Bibi. That's his nickname. His name is Benjamin Netanyahu. But who calls him that? It's too long. Hey, Bibi. Yes? When I see my rector. Yes? Ah, rector, rector, I want to talk to you. Come, come. No, no, I have to go to the toilet. Okay, I'll go with you. <laughs> yes? I, I, I don't really care about anything. Yes? Now, where does this mentality come from? Again, if you go back to our DNA, how we are made, okay? And then think, what is your DNA? When you go back to the Old Testament or to the New Testament, this is what we are. We are herders. We herd cattle. This is where we were born, where we were created. Chinese, a lot of Asians, you grew up in rice paddies, right? You grew rice. So we were herding cattle. Now when you herd cattle, what happens? You sit and do nothing until something happens, like a tiger wants to eat your sheep. Then what do you need to do? Think, act. Think out of the box if you want to call it that way, right? If you're Chinese, like this, what do you do? If you work by the rules and regulations, right, you will not be hungry. Okay? So if we look at Latvian history, mostly farmers, is that correct? Help me out. Yes? Mostly farmers. So your DNA is farming, not herding cattle moving from one place to another. See, I'm a herder, meaning I hold three nationalities. If you tell me what, where is home, I don't know. I have a German passport, American passport, Israeli passport. I have a working visa for China. I have a resident card in China. Yes, so where is home? 
wherever my, my, my bed is or wherever yeah, my family is, that's really where home is, okay? Because my DNA is one of a person who moves from one place to another, yes? This is, this is how I think. Now, how does that really affect innovation? So first of all, we have a highly networked society, very similar maybe to Latvia. We all know everybody, or we know somebody who knows somebody, meaning that everybody is two phone calls away. Meaning if I want 10 minutes with the Minister of Finance, I know how to get those 10 minutes. Now no, because it's elections, but give one more month when things die down. Yes, no, no problem to do that. So we all know each other through family, through university, through work. We are all the time networked and we keep our networking, yes, all the time alive. Another thing, because we are a very, very small country and we hate bureaucracy, we have something called, it's, it, this is in Hebrew, yebeseder. It's, it will be okay, yes? Let's wing it. I don't know if you saw what happened when I came and started the lecture. They came and tried to put this on me and this. And leave it. I'll start talking, it will come. It will be okay. If there is a problem, we'll find a solution. Yes, um, I hate planning in advance. Yes, um, because I'm a herder. Remember, my DNA is when I hit a problem, then I think how to solve it. I tried doing that in China, they were in shock. No, you have to fill out paperwork. I said, what is paperwork? Yes, or we had a meeting on one subject, I wanted to raise another subject. No, you cannot, it doesn't belong to this meeting. I said, so what, but I think it's interesting. Oh yeah, so winging it really promotes innovation because I am solving problems that I've never seen before. Kumbina, anybody from India? John Pashan, do you know John Pashan? Uh, uh, um, Jugad, yeah, yeah, finding a way. Uh, Baharosa Trust, right? It's from, yeah, um, um, very similar to Indians. We hate bureaucracy, we all the time try to find a way around it. So, so it's, 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 it's a way around not working by the book because uh, anybody Chinese? No Chinese? Confucius thinking is working by the book. Don't go left, don't go right. If everything works, go in that way. So we are a country, all the time people talk to each other. We hate hierarchy, meaning if I want to talk to somebody, for instance, um, I wanted many years ago to get accepted to be a professor in one of the top uh, private universities in my country. I sent my CV, nothing happened. Again and again and again, I worked by the book, right? I said, this is not working. So okay, now what do we need to do? Find a Jugad way to get in, right? Find a Kumbina. Do you have that in Latvia? A Sviazi? <laughs> now, yeah, now you understand what I'm talking? Okay, Sviazi? Yes? Anybody from Arab countries? Wasta? No, doesn't say? So we need to find a way around it. So what I did is I looked who is a member of the board of the university. Suddenly I saw a name, ah, I know this person. Somewhere I met this person. So I did research and I found out where I know him from. I got his phone number. I started calling him every week <laughs> until I caught him one day and I'm really a nice person. So he never, I called him, do you have time? No, okay, I'll call you tomorrow again. Until one day, I caught him in the airport. He said, Ron, you're a nice guy. What must I do that you stop calling me? <laughs> I said, one thing, I will send you my CV. You will send my CV to that person. If you do that, you will never hear from me. Okay? I'm lecturing at that university for 12 years already. Okay? Because when somebody gets a CV from a board member of your university, you invite that person for an interview. Now it's up to me to be good, yes? Now, 
in China? You would never do that, right? Would you do that in Latvia? M maybe, yeah. Again, it, so I have no respect for hierarchy. I have respect to what I want and to my knowledge, and I use my networks to get what I want. This is Yebesedev Kombina, yeah, two phone calls away. So really, when you have a culture of informality, when you have a culture that everything is possible, what does that lead? To thinking and creating new things, okay? But what is the problem here? That my country is very good at small, medium enterprises. We are very bad at managing big companies. Why? Because you cannot manage a big company in a chaotic fashion. Yes? So same thing as Latvia. We are 8 million people. Yeah? So still, this chaos can work. But think about trying to manage 1.5 billion people in China. If there is no hierarchy, it will break down. Yes, I tried to do that in China. I was there for something like four months working as a full-time professor there. Yes, very difficult because I did everything. Don't worry, it'll be okay. And said, no, it won't be okay. There are rules and regulations and you have to work by that. Okay, so um, this type of culture of informality where you say to the other person exactly what you think of them. I come to you and say, in your face, okay? We are a very low context culture, yes? And we don't take anything to heart. We can fight, yell at each other, and 10 minutes later go and drink coffee together. Yes, the Chinese students in my country are in shock. We fight, 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 and then, okay, we fought, we got it out of a system, yes? And very good, you know, when I started my PhD, yes? Um, my supervisor came to me and looked at me and said, Ron, you're an idiot. Come back when you're smarter. Yes, a Chinese student, yeah, will get totally depressed. I said, okay, I'm an idiot. What do I need to do? Become smarter. What must I do? Read. Yes, so I'm in, in my country when I lecture and a student asks a stupid question, what do I tell them? It's a stupid question, I won't answer it. Think again, and tomorrow, ask the same question, but in a smart way. So we are very, very, how would I say, maybe aggressive. We, we, are, we have less manners. Like when I did my PhD in the UK, a friend of mine was in my way, so I said, move. Yeah, I pushed him to the side. Um, I didn't think anything of it. They said, no, you don't do that in the UK. What do you do? Excuse me, can you move? I said, but that's a waste of energy. Just move, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, but I've learned this. So this is something that we have, and this brought us to a mentality, the more they attack us, the more that we will succeed. The more people come and tell us, this cannot be done, the more I will show you that this can be done, okay? For instance, when my country was created, the United Nations says something between six to eight months, the country will survive. Ah, we will show you that we can survive. Yes? And my high school teacher told my parents, look, nothing will come out of your son. He's very mediocre, leave it. When I finished my PhD from a very good UK university, I photocopied it and I send it by mail to my teacher. Hmm. I will show you. I won't do it, yes? But I will show you, yes? The more you tell me I cannot, for instance, people came to me and said, working in China is very difficult. Ah, I will show you that I'm going to be a full professor in a top Chinese university. I did that for three months, four months, and I quit. That was too much bureaucracy, but what did I do? I showed. So. Even today, when you look at the army, for instance, missiles are coming to Israel. Everybody said, there's nothing to do about it. Nothing to do about it? We'll show you. Israel is the first country that has a three-layer anti-missile system. And then 
what did they do? They started digging tunnels. They said there's nothing that can be done about it. It took us another six months, and we found a way to locate these tunnels. Okay? So the more people tell us you cannot do something, the more we want to do it. Okay? This is part of this culture of I cannot fail. This is not an option. Okay? So this is part of our DNA. Let's look for a second at religion. Hmm. What does that mean in religion? I'm Jewish. What does that mean by being Jewish? Hmm? My hair. Yes, but that's outward looking. But being Jewish, among other things, is asking questions. Okay? Um, we have many holidays that part of the, of the um, system is asking questions. Why did Moses take us out from Egypt? Why is this? Who is God? Think about it. We, leave, we believe in a God that we cannot see. We cannot touch. Yes? So what is it? So really from an early age, we promote our children to ask questions. Many questions. Yes? How did I come to this world? Who is God? Who made God? Who made the world? Yes? All the time questions. Not all the questions I know how to answer. But we promote questions. Think about Christianity. Think about Islam. Think about Buddhism, Hinduism. Let's take Christianity just for a second. Can you come to church and ask, I don't know, your priest, how did Christ get reincarnated? Is that a question you'll ask? No. Yes? Why is he special? Okay, <coughs> I'm getting uncomfortable, right? You see, th that's the difference? With us, there are no taboos on questions. Okay? I, I get annoyed with my children when they don't ask me questions. Yes? Ask me difficult questions. And this is some of the points. Even in Islam, you're allowed to ask some kind of questions. But some things you do not talk about. Like, who is Allah? Why is he special? Okay? With us, maybe it's a weakness. We have no respect for hierarchy. We ask straightforward. For instance, when I teach in my country in doing business in China, undergraduate student, first year, raises his hand and says, Ron. Hmm, I'm not Ron, I'm Professor Berger, right? But he said, Ron, what makes you an expert on China that you're good enough to teach us on China? Now, in Latvia, you never ask the professor such a question. I looked and I said, hmm, good question. And I explained why I'm an expert. He said, okay, now I'll attend your class so I know you're not wasting my time. Okay? Now, I respected that student. I didn't like in the beginning the question. But it is very, very competitive. We ask difficult questions. And I respect smart questions. Yes? But ask, because if you don't ask, you don't get knowledge. So our religion brings us to ask as many questions as possible, because what does that do? It makes us think. And when we think, what happens? We become a knowledge economy. Yes? Using our brain. Not accepting anything for granted. It's also very difficult, because sometimes I get tired. I have three children asking me questions all the time. Yes? So, and again, I cannot bullshit them. Because my daughter is 14, she Googles it at the end and checks me out. And if I'm wrong, ah, I'll show father, yes, that I'm wrong. Even at university, they have a hobby to see if they can ask me a question that I cannot answer. Yes? So these are things that really push you to be better, push you to cross the frontiers. Okay? Hard life, but it is something. Another point that pushes us to be an startup nation is how do we see failure okay 
Failure is starting a business and going bankrupt. Failure is going to an exam and flunking. Yes, failure is a failure. Now, I view failure as a learning process, meaning that if you tried and failed, I ask, what have you learned from that failure? Okay, if you failed again, and you give me the same reason, I didn't study hard enough for the exam, like if my daughter failed, I ask her, why did you fail, I didn't study? Okay, what have you learned? I must study more. Okay, next time, if that happens, no, then she gets punishment. Yes, but failure is a learning process. So we even have conferences, seminars in my country, where we invite startup companies, managers who failed. Please talk about your failures. And I'm very proud of my failures because I've learned something from it. Even in the army, I was a missile engineer. Yes? I had many missiles coming back at me. Yes? Almost people got killed. But what did I do? I learned from it and I became better and the systems I worked on became better. When I asked that in China, they say, no, failure is bad because we lose face, mianzi, yes? And that is very bad for my reputation, yes? So how do you see failure in Latvia? Is it something that you don't talk about failures? Or, yeah, you don't talk about it. That's not good failure. You always have to have your Instagram, everything is fine, I'm always in control, I'm always happy, although I'm totally depressed, <laughs> yes, and I have no clue what I'm doing in life, but in my Instagram, every day is a beautiful day, okay? So we in Israel view failure as a constructive learning process, okay? And a 2006 Harvard research has shown that a manager who's failed in the past, if he starts again, his probability of failing goes down because he's learned something from his mistakes. If you listen to Bill Gates from Microsoft, he says that success is the worst teacher because the higher you are, the harder the fall. If you've never failed in life, the first time you'll fail, you'll be totally depressed. But when you're young, even at university, you failed, 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 what does it make your character? Strong. If you understand how to accept failure, learn from it, and move ahead. Again, I'm telling you, I have failed many times. But these failures taught me how to be a better person, how to be a better academic, how to be a better manager, how not to do things. There are some things that I'm not good at. Then, for instance, I'm very bad at managing people. Yes? So I know I don't want to be a manager, although I had my own investment house. Yes? I'm, I did manage people, but I thought I was good, but then I saw that maybe I'm not that good, so I've learned not to do that. Yeah? And in our country, startups has become a national sport. Yes? Today, creating your own company, your own startup, your own idea, wow, we all love it. Every university, college in my country has at least one incubator. And even students come to me after the lecture, Ron, can you be an advisor to our idea? And they all the time talk to me, I, I cannot go to the toilet because a group walks to with me all everywhere and all the time ask me questions. And I say, listen, I need some quiet. Okay, we'll talk quietly. They, they don't understand and no. Yes? I try, it's like glue, they stick. But they do it in a nice way. And what happens at the end of the day? They get my time. If I'll do that to a Chinese student, okay, they go away. No, no, no. If you want to succeed, you must push. You must understand that failure is part of it. So we say constructive failures. Embrace risk, accept failure. So if you were not reckless, if you did things by the book, then I will forgive you for your failures. And we have songs about failures. We have conferences about failures. We don't like failures. But we understand that if you want to be an innovative person, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to accept 
failures because if 95% of startup companies fail, yes, then, okay, if I want to be those 5% that succeed, like when you go here in Latvia with your car, you turn on Waze, right? You know Waze? Yeah. It's Israeli company. Yeah? yeah? Mobileye, Israeli company. Most of Intel chips were invented in Israel. A lot of the chips you have in your phone were invented in Israel. Intel has a very, very big R&D center in Israel. Okay? A lot of products and services you use today are Israeli products. And why have they become part of Google or Intel? Because they've become too so big, we don't know how to manage them. We're a small country. We're good in inventing things. We're bad at what? Managing. So once a company becomes big, we sell it. We start a new thing because it's no fun managing a big company. It's getting boring. What do we want? Chaos, thinking, people running, people moving. Yes, this different thing. Even I at university, every three or four years, I change a job because I get bored. I get too comfortable. Yes, I always like looking for this new adventure. And then I don't sleep about a week. Yes, because wow, what did I do? I left a good job to start something new. Who knows if it will succeed or not? But at the end of the day, that's what makes me tick. That's what makes me drive. This is what makes me love life. Yes, why am I on earth? To make a change, to make the world better, okay? So really, we are a culture that rewards risk-taking. Yes? Calculated risks. We are a culture must win. Yes? Even in the army, we cannot lose. Because if we lose, our country is gone. Yes? Even me, as a lecturer, in Israel, we are have about five universities. So if I'm now standing in front of you, if I cough a bit, there are about two professors standing there that want my job. Okay? Think about it. Competition is extremely fierce. So I have to know, I have no choice. If I want to feed my children, I have to be the best in my field. I always have to think out of the box. I have to always invent new things. I have to go global because Israel is so small. Think Latvia, two million people, right, roughly? Small, nothing. You know, if, if you have to be global if you want to succeed. Israel is eight million. Boring. You know, it's competition is very fierce. Where can I make a name for myself? Where can I sell my products, my ideas? China. Yes, I was in Shuzo, which is next to Shanghai, about next to, it's about four hours ride from Shanghai, but that's a suburb. Only in this small city, there were something like eight universities, 20 colleges, and out of the universities, um, three were, or four were British, yes, one, Cana one Australian, Monash University, Nottingham University, Liverpool University. Uh, each university was about 50,000 students. They were medium-sized universities. Here it's what, about 1,500? In Chinese terms, that's not even uh, a school. Yes, that's a, maybe a small department within the university. Think about the size. Yes, so competition there is easy, right? Coming here, going all over the place. So we have to think global because why is food so expensive or relatively expensive in Latvia? Small market. If you want to grow, you have to think from the day you're born to be global. So think about your education. Don't focus on Latvia. Focus. How can I take what I've been taught by my professors and take it on a global scale? Okay? This is a small country. Too small. Okay? And, again, persistence, endurance, commitment. You have to believe in what you do. Remember, people will follow you because of the why. I don't know if you ever heard of the three circles, what, how, and why. We all know what you do. We all know how you do it. But what are we missing? The why. Why are you on this earth? Yes? Why is Apple such a successful company? Not because they make good phones. It's because Apple, from the beginning, said, we will fight the big brother. Then it was IBM. 
than it was Intel. Yes, they go against the big companies. They believe in thinking differently. So, you know, I have a nice Samsung, but for me it's a phone. If it breaks, I'll buy another one. My wife has an Apple. If it breaks, <gasps> my, my son, yeah, she starts crying. I said, buy a new one. You don't understand. It, it's my Apple. Yes, she's connected to that phone. Yes, a lot of people are connected. Apples, um, um, really a lot of its value comes from why am I here on earth? But that's another lecture, yeah? Martin Luther King, I have a dream. People can connect to that. So you, as the future leaders of Latvia, future young people, you must think, why am I here? Yes? How can I get people to follow me, follow my dream? Okay? This is something that um, um, we teach and ask people to do. So let's try to summarize culture. Our culture, our DNA, comes from herding, chaos. We don't listen to anybody. If I tell my daughter, go to your room, she looks at me like that, she's 14. Why? Explain to me. If I agree with you, I'll go to my room. If not, let's negotiate. I say, I'm father. So what? That doesn't make you any better than me. Yes, we believe in equality. <laughs> okay, what do I do? And then my wife looks at me and says, ah, let's see what you'll do now. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah? If I hit her, no, no, you're not allowed to do that in my country. No, no, no. So I need to talk to her. And I'm becoming all red. And I said, listen, you did this, this and this. No, father, you're wrong. I did this and this and this, and you saw it this. And we have a whole conversation. Now, it's very difficult to manage a family like that. Because the only one who listens to me in the house is the dog. If I tell the dog, come, he comes. If I say, go, he goes. Yes, this is why I have a dog, so I feel a manly man. Otherwise, in my house, everybody thinks they know the best. So my house is total chaos. But what happens in my house? A lot of innovative ideas. For instance, my daughter comes to me, she's 14. She says, father, I want to open a business because I want to some money, to make money. So I told her, okay, what do you want to do? She says, I have an idea. I looked in Taobao. Do you know Taobao? It's the Chinese eBay. And she does, a, how do you call it, a, a painting on fingernails for children. So she opened a business for nail polishing for her friends. And she has a machine, yes? And she takes one euro, one euro per finger, yes? And she has her Facebook, and she starts publishing it and I see people coming in and out of my house. And she says, no, Father, I have a business. Yes, and I gave her startup money. And she pays me with interest. <laughs> yes, with interest. Why? She must understand that nothing is given free. I gave her a loan. We have a contract. Yes. I told her she can get her room rent free. That's her office. Yes, but she pays when I go to China, I buy her all the things she needs for the machine, but she pays for it. Yes? But what do I teach her? Business, right? Innovation, thinking. So think about it, how to manage a classroom of these people that ask the teacher. Okay? So our DNA is all the time checking boundaries. How do I cross it? All the time doing these things. Okay. Let's look at infrastructure because time-wise, we don't have too much time. Right? When, when do we finish? Uh, 15 to uh, well, 2 o'clock roughly. Okay, so we're we okay. Um, let's look at the infrastructure. What do I mean by infrastructure? Infrastructure is what did the government build, invest to create startup nation. So let's start with army. Okay? That you must understand how the um, Israeli army works which is very different than the Russian army, um, maybe Chinese army, British army, American army, very, very different. The Israeli army is mandatory, meaning all women from 18 do two years 
army, men do three years army, okay? Now, what happens today that even the women want um, to have meaningful jobs? For instance, my cousin, blonde hair, long hair, beautiful girl, she decided she wants to be an active tank commander. Oh yeah, she's an officer and she commands a tank. And in the Gaza Trip, she needed to make decisions if to fire and take out a building. And she was something like 19 and a half year old when she had to make that decision. Meaning that our army is built on bottom up and not up down. Meaning if I'm an officer, I tell you, you must protect this area. I don't tell you how. Why? Remember, we come from herding animals. I am in far away from this area. I don't know. You are in the area. You must take decisions. Understand? Now, if you're reckless, you'll be in jail. But if you made a mistake, but you can explain that you worked by the book, you had good mental thinking, no problem, because we can learn from it. So really, what does the army teach us? It teaches us to be managers, right? Because think about it, you go to the army at 18, you finish basic training after three months, you do another six months, then you go to officer school, then you become a tank commander, think about it, and suddenly you command people with M16s, yes, and you must decide, do I shoot that person? Don't I shoot that person? You have to live with your decision. So think, these are people, when you go to the university, you go to university after the army. So students who sit in front of me have seen things in life. They have managed people. They have taken hard decisions in their life. Yeah? So the army teaches you what? To take responsibility. Yes? to make decisions, to think independently. What saved my country from being extinct when a lot of the Arab countries invaded Israel? If we were very weak. They, they got to their positions, they stopped and said, um, Home Office, what do we need to do from here? Because we reached our targets. And that gave us enough time to muster a defense. In my country, today, we tell our soldiers, you must do things. You can do it. You must do it because if you do not protect the line, your families are at risk. We're a very small country. So we have no choice. Failure is not a choice. I have to succeed. If you look at my body language, you can see, yeah, I want to eat the world. Yes, I, I cannot fail. It's it's not even understandable. Like when I look at my children, I tell them, small children, yeah, eight years old, 12 years old, and 14 years old, I really talk to them about university. Sometimes I take them with me to class. I take them, take a day off, sit in the back, see what father does. Smell university, yes? My 14-year-old daughter, she says, father, I want to study physics. Yeah, yes? I'm there, yeah? I, I cannot even think that one of my children will not do a degree in something. It's not, yeah, acceptable. And they know it and they understand. I push them very, very hard. Even in the army, we take calculated risks. We need decisions. So really our army moves from bottom up. Yes? Ideas come from the ground. So we don't generally think about it we don't like saluting. What do we salute? Knowledge. If there is an officer who is an idiot, sorry for saying that, who doesn't know what he's doing, what does he do? His soldiers take him away and they bring a new one in. Yeah? Because people in the ground, they see what's happening. They have new ideas to solve things. Even I at university, I suddenly had a good idea on how to teach. I came to my dean and said, listen, dean, I have a new idea. 
on changing how we teach at this university. He said, come, tell me. Yes, so a lot of the knowledge comes from the bottom. In China, it will never work. In Russia, never work, right? In Latvia, would you go to the rector as a student? Even my, one of my students came to me, Ron, you know what? Maybe you should teach us in a different way. And he came and sat to me and gave me feedback on how I teach. And I'm teaching for over 20 years. But I let him talk to me. And maybe he has good ideas. Because maybe I'm getting disconnected from the young people. Yeah? And they said, yes, I want to talk to you. I want ideas come from the bottom. Yes? So we have no respect for hierarchy. Yeah? And this is very good because ideas float. Maybe 90% of these ideas are bad. But if 10% of them are good, I need what? To know how to really siphon them, how to see what are the good ideas, what are the bad ideas. And if we are all the time scared of losing face by talking rubbish, then we'll never raise ideas. Yes? So Israeli students don't mind looking stupid. Yeah? We have no mianzi, no face in that sense. So even if a student asks a stupid question, and I tell him that's a stupid question, in front of everybody, what have they learned? Think twice before you ask. Do your homework. And some of them continue asking stupid questions. And they say, okay, by being stupid, how do we become smart? Weren't you stupid like us when you were our age? Yeah. Okay. Did the professors let you ask stupid questions? Yes. So you see where you got? I'm going to be there. Yes? So I don't care if you tell me I'm stupid. I know I'm not stupid. And I'll become smarter. Give me a chance. Hmm. That's a fighter, right? That's a somebody who will succeed. Yeah. Because you want that. So everything is possible in life. Yes? Even me, as being an academic, I was, first of all, a practitioner. I left my PhD. I hated it. And I said, OK, I'm going into business. And then one day, I met one of my professors. And I said, you know what? Maybe I'll start publishing, becoming an academic. They told me, you're too old to become an academic. Mm. I'm too old? I'll show you. Within roughly six years, I became a professor. And I have 50 publications. That's more than what they have. Yes? And I sent them my CV and I said, <laughs> you see, I'm not too old. Yes? I will show you. Okay? So never let anybody tell you, not your parents, not your friends, not your bosses, that you cannot do anything, something. Yes? But remember, getting to the Everest, to the mountain, is hard work. Yes? Everything is possible if you're willing to put in the time, the sweat. Life is not easy. There's a lot of competition. Yes? There are a lot of risks. But this is something that is extremely important. What else does the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, give you? Friends for life. Because if I saved your life, you saved my life, right? We are now blood brothers. We are now networked for life. Not only that, the army gives you not only management skills. One of the most secret talked about units in the Israeli army, and I am streamed here, is a unit called 8200. That's the most secretive intelligent unit in our army. If you Google it, you'll find a lot about it. This is where a lot of the innovations come from. Now, 8200 is a unit by invitation only. They bring in musicians, because musicians have different hearing. They bring in mathematicians, artists, to solve problems in missiles, in digging, in intelligence. And they tell this group of heterogeneous, different people, you have now two weeks to find a solution. If you don't find a solution, people will die. OK? Now, these people become extremely professional in solving complicated problems. Not all of them are mathematicians, but what have they learned? To think. Okay? Think about it. 
that you understand some examples. If I use the internet to search for terrorists, okay? So I've been doing that for three years in the army, and then six months before I finish my army, what do they do? They start up their startup company within the army. What? Because I have a few friends, right, in A200 in the unit. And then they say, okay, we're very good at locating through algorithm terroristic activities in the internet. What do they do when they leave the army? They start up a cyber company trying to find financial fraud. It's the same algorithms, right? It's financial terrorism, face recognition. Yes? Think about you read an article in the newspaper. A certain terrorist drove his car in the pretty Swiss Alps and drove off a cliff. Hmm, how did that happen? Think about what is a car today? It's a computer, right? If I know that person through the GPS is in that area and I hack the car, full gas, no brake. You understand what I'm saying? Israel today is one of the leaders in, let's say, antivirus for cars. Hmm, how did that come? Where did that idea come from? Did you ever think that cars need a firewall? Do you know how much computers are today in the more modern cars? Think about airplanes. I can hack into an airplane and do a lot of things with the airplane. Right? Where does this technology come from? Where do all these startup companies come from? So today, just that you understand, a 21-year-old um, boy, girl, who finishes A200, starts with about $15,000 salary a month. Yes? They're headhunted. Meaning, when they come, they, they interview the company, not the company interviews them. Okay? It's, uh, it's, it's, and there are a few of such units. Because these units give you to play with very expensive toys. Yes? They make you think, and a lot of these, I call them children, they're, sorry, 19, 20, but they have so many skills and mindsets. So really, a lot of our startups, if we talk about phone technology, GPS, where do you have this GPS in your phone? It comes from missiles, I don't know if you know. If you think about face recognition, Siri, to talk to your phone, visors, a lot of this technology, touch, comes from what? Government investment. So really, yes, um, the Israeli government is spending a lot of money in the army to create people who are good managers, risk takers, decision makers, thinkers. Yes, people who can yeah, take it hard, sometimes hard life. Yes, so this is part of the infrastructure that creates a successful nation. We're tolerant of failures, yes? And this is something that also gives us. Another point that you have here, um, and again, if you have any questions, please stop me and ask, okay? If you disagree with something I say, or you have another opinion, but all the time think, can this work here in Latvia? Or can it work in India? Or can it work in wherever you come from? We have something called the triple helix model. This works very well in China, where we all the time think, can we get government, academia, and industry to work together? The Chinese have got it down to an art. For instance, why is China a global leader in fast trains? How did China become the global leader in fast, efficient trains? Very easy. The Chinese government has understood that if it wants to move one and a half billion from one place to another, airplanes is too expensive. You know, in China, there are traffic jams in the sky. In Chengdu, where I teach, it's a second tier city, there are three international airports. Okay? <laughs> um, when I came to Riga and I saw the airport here, <laughs> I said, <laughs> okay, interesting. Yes, I saw, it said, my suitcase 
is on conveyor six. There was one conveyor, six. <laughs> yes. And when I passed a, 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 a passport control, there was a door, like in my, in my kitchen. Yes, if you understand what I'm saying, that's an airport. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> okay, that's something. But in China, think about in the holidays, about 800 million people go home, move from one place to another. Do you know what a headache it is to move 800 million people? So you need an efficient train system. So the government said to industry, if you build us a train, we will buy it. Okay, but we don't know anything about trains. Then they came to academia and said, we'll give you money to invent train technology. So really, what do we have here? The government paying for the R&D, right? And the government willing to buy any train industry makes. So if I'm a company, I have to be an idiot not to build trains, right? Because who's taking the risk in R&D? The government, right? They're giving me the money. Who's going to buy my product? The government. So why not work on it? So really what we see even in my country today, the government through the army, through building incubators, is investing a lot of money and bringing academia and industry to work together. Because we want in, in our academy professors who have professional experience. When I remember I said to you, that student asked me, Ron, what makes you an expert about China? Tell me that you didn't just read a book on China and now you're you know, reading me the book. Tell me what you did. Show me that you did what you teach us. Okay? So today, academia is looking for people with practical experience plus academia. So I can show you that what I teach you is things that I did in the past and I know what I'm talking about, not in theory, but in practice. So this is the triple helix model. It's called, how do we bring the government, academia, and industry together? Yes, think about why doesn't a company come here to this university and say, you know what? We're willing to invest. And every person finishing this uh, degree can get a job in my company. Okay, this type of thinking, how do we bring all of them together? So in my country, we have incubator system. One of, I think Israel was the first country who invented the incubator. Why? It comes from immigration. In the middle of 1980, um, Israel was about 4 million people. That's it. And suddenly, 1 million new immigrants came from the USSR. The brick wall fell, and one million people came. Think about today, the second language in Israel is Russian. Okay? If you think about it, in the 1980s, end of 80s, one million people, new immigrants came, mostly from ex-Soviet Union, yes, um, to our country. And now, I cannot find them jobs. What do I do with these people? A lot of them are mathematicians, phys yeah, physics, doctors, professors. But how many do I need? So what our prime minister did, he said, OK, what I'll do is I'll build buildings. I'll give you an office. Invent. You want to survive? You're an immigrant? You know, immigrants are people who take risks. Yes? So you came to this country. I give you now six months salary. If you don't manage to survive, you die. I cannot give you more. So they created this incubator system. And it worked. So really coming and saying, Israel, a startup nation, we have a lot of luck. Because these million people that came to Israel, suddenly you'll see Israelis are very good at um, playing musicians. They're not Israelis, they're Russians. Yes, suddenly we're very good at sports. If you look at their last name, Kozoshvili, and all these, yes, names, yeah, very Israeli, yes, Russians. Suddenly, we're very good at math. 
Yes, if you know a bit about Russian education, math is basic there. Tolstoy, yes. Ex so w this is something that brought us this, this startup nation. We had a lot of luck. So we had one million new immigrants who were very educated. The Jews in these countries were very educated and they just came. And this gave us a lot of knowledge. And we were lucky that we could use that knowledge. Do you have immigrants here? Or opposite, you have right people leaving more than coming. And that's a problem. Yeah? So we have a lot of people who are risk takers who really have no choice but to survive. And this is something we created this incubator program. And today the incubator program is less, is not that good anymore. It's finished its life expectancy. Because today, when we talk about high tech cyber, do I need an incubator? No, I can work in my office, in my room, in my home. What do I need? Computers, friends, and that's it. I don't need an office. What do I need? That's a big problem today, a coffee house. Today, opening a coffee house is high risk. Why? A lot of my friends, their office is a coffee house. They come with a laptop computer, connect to the Wi-Fi, buy two coffees for five hours, they make meetings in the coffee house, and that coffee house loses money. Yes? So what does the coffee house do? Drops the Wi-Fi. What do they do? Connect hotspot. There's always a fight between those, yes, no office people, startups, and the coffee houses. But you'll see in Israel, the coffee houses are generally full. But do they make any money? No. <laughs> yeah, because today we have virtual companies. Yes, people just sitting in different coffee houses. Yes, connecting to one another and creating new things. Israel spends a lot of money on R&D, research and development, a lot of money. Yes, a lot of our taxes goes to R&D, if it is through the army, because there's a big question. That company in cyber, yes, should the government take percentage of that company? Because where did they get their education? In the army. Where did they get their skills? In the army. When did they start a company in the army? Shouldn't I get some of that success? Why should they get it? I as a taxpayer paid for it. There's a big debate on that, yes? But this is something that's happening, but a lot is being spent on that. Education, we already talked about it, yes, um, a lot. When we talk about education, think about it. If you go back, hundreds of years back to the Inquisition, Jews were prosecuted. In my DNA, in my brain, I'm always scared of being prosecuted. So this is why I have three passports. German, American, Israeli. I have a Chinese working, I opened a Chinese bank account. I have there a bank account. Yes, I spread my risks because I'm always scared that somebody will come and take something away from me. It's just inside, okay? And there's one thing that nobody can take away from me. What I have here, right? They can take my house, they can take my money, but what can they not take away from me? My knowledge. So if, if it's part of our DNA, I tell my children, knowledge is power. Why did I tell you about physics? There are two things that are global language, English and math, right? Math is a global language. Yeah, even art or music is math. It's a way of thinking. Cyber is math. It's a language. Doesn't matter if it's in English, if it's in French, German, Latvian. Math is a way of thinking. English is a language, yeah, for all the world. So if you have those two, the world opens up to you. Yeah? And that's something very, very uh, um, uh, special. So we say educational culture, the dream of every Jewish mother, pushing children hard. Yes? I push my children extremely hard, even too hard. Yes? I spend about 20% of my salary on private lessons for my children. Yes? If it's 
horseback riding, swimming, skiing, math, English, yes? So they have a wide knowledge base. Yeah? And this really pushes them that you see amount of engineers in Israel in, in relation to other subjects. We have a very high percentage of engineers. Yes, you cannot see it, but in, in per, per 10,000 employees. And our engineers are thinkers. If we look at India, Indians are very good at doing things. I, I need to tell them what to do. In Israel, we do what we want. That's also a problem. I have my own ideas. You put me on a si different subject, uh, on a certain path, I go off this path. Please. Um, we are not pushing that strong like in China, the Gakao exams, or in Japan. Yes, and um, we have problems. Um, social media is becoming very problematic in my country because there's a lot of harassment on social media. So there are suicides because of social media. Less of education pushing. Because we push hard, but we are together. I, d I don't come and say your future, you represent the future of the family. That if you, if you mess up, we lose face. No. You mess up, okay, we try again and again and again until you'll succeed. Okay, so not that hard, but for instance, this is my small son, this is my house. Yes? He's going to be an engineer. We all know it. He's eight years old. I told him that every course in the innovation I teach, I will show his picture. And he's very proud of the Lego that he's built. Okay? I push, whenever I'm in China, I buy Chinese Lego. It's very cheap. Yes? And they have to build. What does that make them? Learn how to read the map. Right? How to be, connect things together. It's a certain way of thinking. So through games as well, I push them very hard. Yes? So I, I buy Lego. And I say, why, you didn't build the Lego I bought you? I'm not going to buy you a new present until you finish this one. So they start wor working to get a new present. So it's this, you know, it's a different type of pushing through games, through not necessarily exams, but if you look, if we have six universities in Israel, three of them are in the top 100 best universities in the world. Okay? Why? Because to get into university in Israel is almost impossible. Because there's high competition. There's quite a few colleges. To be a professor at university, high competition. Our, our world is very small, like here. But we're very, very competitive. Okay? So, education. Next, immigration. We already talked about it. Israel is a country of immigrants. Until today, if you can be prove that you are Jewish, automatically you get an Israeli passport, one year salary from the government, and they teach you the language. And for, I think, four years, you pay no taxes on your income. Okay? You just come to Israel. Okay? As long as you can prove that your mother is Jewish, that you are Jewish, it goes by the mother. Okay? Automatically, you get accepted to our country. Okay? That's part of our constitution. So, an immigrant is a person who is willing to take risks. Okay? So if you have 40%, if not more, immigrants, think about it. If you go to Israelis and say, ask them, how many generations are you in Israel? You'll find very few people who are third generation. I was not born in Israel. I was born in America. My father was born in Germany. Yeah? Yeah? My wife was born in Romania. So think about the mixture that we have here. My sister is born somebody whose parents came from Egypt. So we are this immigrations. So people who are immigrants, they're risk takers. They also, when you have immigrants, what does that mean? We think differently. And when you take a group of students, a group of people that think differently, 
and makes them what work together? What do we have? Ideas. In China, 97% are from Han. If I'll come to a Chinese person and say, how many generations are you in China? Nine, 10, yes? We'll go back to the Mongolians, yes? We all are, yeah? Is it uh, Latvia? What are you? Also immigrants or, yeah? Many, many, your forefathers were Latvians. So immigrants, a lot of immigrants as well. But why did they come here? I'm German. Yeah, so, but again, immigrants are people who left all their belongings and came with a nothing. Yes, this nothingness. These are people who have no choice but to survive. And that really pushes our country forward because think, if we lose a war, we're in the sea. If we have no water, I was really surprised um, because I'm a professor, I like traveling the world at other people's expense, of course, yes? And I was invited to a conference to South Africa in a beautiful place called Cape Town. Have you heard of it? Beautiful, full of water, right? Mountains, water. And I went to the five-star hotel and it says, please don't use any water, we're running out of water. I said, what are you talking about? Look, there's water here, just pump it. Clean it. In South Africa, in Cape Town, if the water doesn't go into this reservoir, they have no water. I was really surprised. In Israel, there's no water. So what do we do? Desalinate. We take water from the sea and make it drinking water. Today, about 80% of our water comes from the sea. So it, we don't care if it rains or doesn't rain. Electricity, solar power, water power, this power, because... We don't know what will happen. We have to what? We have to take care of ourselves. We have nobody to take care of us. Yes, here in, in Latvia, if you don't have enough electricity, can you ask one of your neighbors, can you give us some electricity? The power grid, you're connected. No problem. Yes, we cannot do that. Yes, and also, what does immigration give us? We have a lot of friends overseas. I still have friends in Germany, family in Germany, family, yes, in Romania through my wife, yes? So if I need to do business, I can always use my what? International network, my Jewish network, my Israeli network, yes? This type of, of networking is, is in us, okay? Let's go to the last thing because we have six minutes. And again, if you have any questions, please ask me. And all the time think, what can you learn from it? Because you are the next generation of this, of this country. How can I use this to this country's use? Small country, island mentality. You'll see something very interesting. Most of the islands are very innovative. Singapore, Ireland, um, Japan. Uh, Australia is, is, a, is, a, is more than an island. It's a very big island. Talk about smaller ones. That's why I didn't say UK as well. But once you're an island, yes, you need to be born global from day one. Even if we look at Latvia, you have to be global because the market is very small. Israel is a virtual island because I cannot really um, ask for help from my neighbors, even Ireland. They have to take care of themselves. Japan, they have to take care of themselves, natural resources, okay? So this island mentality um, really creates a mindset that when you're born, you're born global. A company that's born sees Israel as a test case, right? Automatically, I need to think, do my products have applications overseas? 
Yes? Even my children were born global. A week after they were born, I took them where? To the German embassy, German passport. Why? You never know what will happen if they change the laws. German passport, American passport, Israeli passport, and let's see what other passport they can get themselves. But at least I gave them the opportunity to be born global. English, math, three passports. Is there any country that they cannot go into? I can go into Iran if I want. With a German passport, they like me. I won't do that, but yes, I can play around with it. The world is open, okay? So we all the time think about what? We're a small country, we're an island, so we have to take care of ourselves, and what? We need to be born global day one. Do you have that same mentality here? We have to be global in our language, in our abilities, in our products, in our services. Okay? This is something that makes you what? Succeed. History. We talked about it as well. Because historically we were prosecuted. So what do we need to do? Always prepare to what? To spread our risks. Create knowledge. Something that nobody can take uh, from us. We live in a, in a life of uncertainty. We have no government. Who cares? I don't know if I will live tomorrow or not. I live in a life of uncertainty. The only certainty I have is uncertainty. Okay? So, I say every day is a new day. Let's see what it brings. Yes, suddenly I was invited to Latvia. I opened the map to see where Latvia was. Yes? Sorry. Yeah? And I said, what is in Latvia? How many times it took me to, to agree to come? Yeah, it was a bit of a problem. But I said, let's come with an open mind and see what I can do here. Can I put some global yeah, fingers and see what I can, yeah, how can I help them and they help me? So let's look around, get to know people, network, make friends. Yes, this is a way of, of thinking. Uncertainty, no planning. Yes, funding. Israel does not have a lot of money. We're not, the people are relatively rich, the government is relatively poor. So if I'm a startup, for instance, I run, I've tried a number of times to get a grant, a research grant of something like 3,000 US dollars. Very difficult, competition, fierce. When I was in China, Startup money for a new professor in China, $20,000, just start research. Take. Do whatever you want with it. And that's startup money. Now, if you use that money, don't worry. There's government money, local provincial money, there's industry money. Money is too easy. So in China, money is too easy. In my country, if you manage to get money, if you manage to survive, if you want to be a professor at university, you have to be very good. If you have a startup and you get one cent, you have to be very good because competition is very fierce. And this is why you'll see a lot of funds come to Israel because the money goes farther, okay? If you're not good, nothing, you won't even, the, the sand is not very fertile. So only the strongest survive. This is why I tell some of my friends who have not that good startup, go to China. You'll get a lot of money. Your ideas are great for China but you need to live in China. Think about that. Even in India, getting money in India is not easy, right? But if you do some, yes, you got engineering, you can go very, very far. Yeah, natural resources. Israel has very few natural resources. We have what? The Dead Sea, right? Nice Dead Sea, right? Yeah, there's a lot of salt there, okay. We found some gas, that's lately. We have religion, because Israel is one of the centers of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, okay. But really that's it. Sand, problem, yes, that's what we have. So when you study about ma a bit more about international business, they'll teach you Porter's diamond model that says, really, we have two types of natural resources things that God gave us and things 
that the government made. So the government said, okay, if we don't have natural resources, what must we do? Government made resources, which is what? Brain power. So Israel has invested a lot in what? In brain power. In people who think, because it's a renewable source of making money. A lot of Israelis make a startup, sell it, make a new one, sell it, make a new one, sell it, and it's a hobby. Okay? And that's how it works. And it never ends. When you look at petrol, it finishes. Dubai has no more petrol. Yes? So they understood. So they made banking and a lot of uh, uh, tourism. Okay? And diaspora is really connections. <coughs> and one of the most famous startup persons is called Chai Agassi. He really invented the electric car. He was too early. He failed with Renault. He's our biggest failure. But I think now he's the CEO of SAP. Yes, because he failed so many times. Yes, um, he has a lot of knowledge. Yes, he even ma managed to bring the president of Israel to be on the board of directors of his company. Yes, and he gave a big TED talk about um, success. And if we had time, I would let you see this TED talk. Okay? So if we try to summarize, right, we are out of time. I'm two minutes over time. What made Israel a startup nation? Luck, when we had immigrants, smart immigrants. We had a lot of no luck, where we have nothing. So when you have nothing, you have two choices, survive or die. If we look at Africa, sorry for saying it, they've decided what? To die. Because if I have nothing, I can sit down and say how poor I am. Or what can I do? I'll show you that I can. Okay? So it's this mentality. It's this survival instinct. So what we have is we had a lot of knowledge brought to us from Russia, from other very, very smart states. And really, we want to survive. And this is what created this startup. And what do we do? We export knowledge. Yes? If you go to the top American universities, you'll see there a high percentage of Israeli professors. If you look at the amount of Nobel Prize winners in medicine, economy, Israelis, as a relation to our small country. Why? Because we have no choice. Questions? Anything you want to add? Comments about my talk today? It was more informal. Anything? If not, thank you for your time. Ah. Uh, from when did you give money from uh, to integration for uh, science? 18. Uh, uh, 80s, roughly middle 80s. Um, we didn't really give money. We gave you an office. But you gave them salary. <laughs> that is by any immigrant gets it. But if I give you salary six months, this is the problem today in African incubators. They go to an incubator to get salary, they don't do anything. Here I give you what, six months salary? And if you don't, after six months, self-sufficient, you die. It finishes. So you have now startup time, seed money. So first of all, I need to teach these people the language. A lot of them, so in Israel, when you drive, you can see three languages. Hebrew, Russian, Arabic. <laughs> yes, so signs are very big because everything you need to write in three languages. Yes? Um, that's, there's no choice. So even today, the immigrants that came from Russia want to study in schools that teach in Russian. They s read Russian literature. It's part of their heritage. So what is Israel? It's a mixture of different cultures. Yes, think about somebody that comes from German, Germany, that everything is by the book with somebody who comes from Egypt together, chaos. Yes, but that's what makes life interesting. Any more things? Please. What? Of course. Um, you, I have the can you send it to the students? I can send all. 
Yes, the presentation I will send you is longer than this one because it's my present was built for three hours and they suddenly they told me it's only an hour and a half. So I threw many slides out. I made it much shorter. Yeah, and you have my email, so if you want to ask me questions. But the important thing is for you, as the future young people, think, how can I take lessons from Israel and implement it here? Okay? This is the gist of things. And then I have another lecture, I don't know if you'll come, on really Israeli innovation, systematic innovation thinking. That will be tomorrow. I don't know if you're invited or not to it, but this is showing uh, that... Anybody can be an innovator. You don't have to be creative to be an innovator. Thank you for your time. See you next time. We will be opening also the... Uh, prolonged application for Erasmus summer and fall internships. So, yes, that's all from me. And I'll try to find uh, your group names and send you the presentation in, yeah, yes, to your emails. Yeah. And by the way, it's not so bad time to have a startup here in Latvia. So there are a lot of fundings from Latvian government, this yes. Yes, for seed money, good. When you get after our accelerator, it's a little bit harder, but.